In the last three decades, our catalogue of known planets has exploded from the familiar eight planets which orbit around the sun to now thousands of worlds orbiting distant stars across the sky. And to many, this has been seen as an extension of the Copernican revolution, really picking up where Copernicus left off. Back in the 16th century, he controversially argued that the Earth was not special, that we are not the center of the universe. Instead, he proposed that the sun was at the center and that the Earth orbits around it, a so-called heliocentric model. And this began the so-called Copernican Revolution, where astronomers sequentially demoted the special status of our home world, piece by piece. And in fact, we now know that the Sun is itself a fairly typical star, located in a mundane humdrum part of the galaxy, and yes, in turn, in a fairly ordinary galaxy. And yet, despite this, there are two final nails in the Copernican Revolution which remain elusive. Is life typical? And is intelligence typical? Of the 4,000 confirmed exoplanets, the vast majority have been discovered using just one technique, the transit method. This is the bread and butter of my team here at the Cool Worlds Lab, and indeed for many exoplanet teams across the world. It has one major advantage and one major drawback. The advantage of this method is really just that it's so damn simple. All you really have to do is just take a photo of a star over and over and over again, and it doesn't even really matter if that photo is blurry, because all we're going to do is simply measure how bright is that blob of light in each one of those photos. Now, how does that possibly result in the detection of an exoplanet, you might well wonder. Well, if a planet around that star has the right orbital alignment, it will sometimes pass in front of the star, thereby blocking out some of the star's light. And in our set of photos, you can see this. The blob appears very slightly dimmer, just for a short interval. And that's what we call a transit. Transits are amazing because they let you figure out things like the size of the planet, its orbit, whether it has rings or moons, what its atmospheric chemistry might be, and even the ablateness of a distant world. They really are like an astronomical cheat code for learning about distant planets. So what's the disadvantage of the transit method? Well, transiting planets only make up a small fraction of the total number of worlds out there. Remember that we only get to see transits if the orbital alignment is just right. The probability of this occurring equals the radius of the parent star divided by the planet's orbital separation. For the Earth and the Sun, that's half a percent, or 1 in 200. And so, for every Earth-like planet that we see transiting, there should be about another 200 which don't have quite the right alignment, and thus, we can't see them. And so, in many cases, we can detect planets transiting in front of their stars using this technique. Alien worlds. And so, one night lying in bed, you might suddenly sit up straight to the sharp realization that, hey, an alien civilization could be using this on us. They could be watching us right now using the transit method. Yet more, we can actually figure out precisely which stars are capable of seeing us in this state. The Earth orbits the Sun in a two-dimensional plane that we call the ecliptic. Any star lined up with the ecliptic will certainly see the Earth pass in front of the Sun for about 13 hours, once every 365 days. But even observers slightly off axis will see us transit out to an angle of 0.3 degrees either side. And this means that any stars lying inside this cone will see the Earth transit. And of course, this is just one particular slice in time. 
As the Earth moves around the Sun, it sweeps out this cone in all directions, forming a flared disk. Anyone living around a star in this volume will see the Earth transit the Sun once per year, if they look for it. Now let's take it a step further. Each one of these near-ecliptic stars can see us transit, but that doesn't mean that we can see them transit. Remember that the transit probability of an Earth-like planet in front of a Sun-like star is about 1 in 200. And so following through the math, this means that 1 in 200 squared, or 1 in 40,000, of the nearby stars around us have just the right configuration such that we can see them transit and they can see us transit. So they're watching us, watching them, watching us, watching them. Reciprocal transits. In fact, we already know of some planets like this. NASA astronomer Chris Burke highlighted that the planet WASP-47b not only appears to transit its star from our point of view, but inhabitants of that planet would also see us, the Earth, transit in front of our star, the Sun. We can even simulate what the transits of the Earth would look like from their perspective, assuming they had telescopes similar to that of our own. Unfortunately, WASP-47b is decidedly not an Earth-like planet. It's a hot Jupiter system. But it does prove the point that these reciprocal transit configurations do exist. And it also begs the question, okay, how many of these Earth-like reciprocal transits might we expect to be out there? The Milky Way's thin disk extends up and down by about a thousand light years away from the galactic plane where the Sun pretty much lives. This means that we could draw a sphere of 1,000 light years in radius around us and expect that there should be an approximately fairly constant density of stars within this region. With a local stellar density of about 0.004 stars per cubic light year, that translates to there being about 20 million stars within this volume. And of these, one in 40,000 will have the reciprocal transit configuration. So that's 500 stars, but let's call it 1,000 to account for the fact that many of these stars will be smaller than the Sun and thus have closer in temperate regions, thereby inflating their transit odds. Sadly, we don't know how many of these stars have Earth-like planets around them, despite what you may have heard otherwise. If you want to learn more about that, we actually shot a video all about that topic just recently. But assuming the number is optimistic, and also assuming that intelligent life frequently appears on these worlds, then it is quite possible that there are instances where we have two civilizations watching each other transit. We know that transits can teach us a lot about distant planets, and so it's reasonable to assume that if we are indeed being monitored using the transit method, then an advanced civilization would be quite capable of determining that the Earth is inhabited. If we felt really paranoid about this, then there are actually ways in which we could cloak either our entire planetary signature, or perhaps more realistically, just the signature of life, the biosignatures that our planet presents, using a laser cloaking system. That's something we've figured out in our group here at the Cool Worlds Lab. We wrote a paper about that, and I'm going to put a link down below for you so you can watch the video we filmed on this earlier. But assuming that our counterparts on the other side of this transit bridge aren't doing this, then it's quite possible that in the near future, our telescopes will be able to identify clear evidence for biology on their planet. And so we know that they're there, and they would know that we're here. If so, what then? Well, we have two civilizations who know that each other's worlds are inhabited, but they are separated by potentially hundreds of light years. Well, the reciprocal transit configuration is particularly interesting here because it means that these worlds are somehow linked together. They know that we're transiting, and we know that they know we're transiting, 
and they know that we know that they know that. Okay, so could we somehow use this? Could we somehow exploit this to have a communication, to have a dialogue with this other distant civilization? It's almost like a tin can telephone stretched across the cosmos. In that case, the piece of string carries vibrations which convey information between the cans. Could we introduce vibrations, or more accurately, perturbations into our transit signature to equally send some kind of information? One possible way of doing this would be to use lasers, which we could point at this distant star and then beam energy towards it at the moment at which we transit. Because the Earth only blocks out 80 parts per million of the Sun's energy, then these lasers don't need to compete with the total luminosity of a star. Moreover, it's even better than that because lasers are directed energy beams. They are not isotropically emitting in all directions. And so it actually turns out that the amount of power you need to do this is of order of megawatts or even kilowatts of power, something we could reasonably do today. If you want more details about those calculations, then you can see the paper we wrote on that topic, again, linked down below in the description. At the simplest level, we could just use these lasers to make our transit look funky. Just a way of saying, hey, we're here. If they reciprocate this signal, then perhaps we might think about sending more information. And we could accomplish this using the very same laser beam system just to say hello. We could go a little bit further and modulate its frequency, its timing, even its amplitude to send very detailed information down the beam. So we could send our Wikipedia pages, our subreddits, or even the Cool World's YouTube library. It could be the beginning of our first galactic conversation. Now certainly these methods can also be used on misaligned, non-transiting planets as well. But there it becomes difficult to agree upon a communication medium and time. For transiting planets though, it's different because all observers can agree on the rarity and precise timing of these very special events, thereby forming a natural window in which to attempt communication. This is kind of like being told to say, meet a stranger in New York City, but that's all the information you were given. I mean, New York City is a big place, where do you meet them? You might think, well, maybe I'll choose somewhere like Times Square, somewhere very central as a best guess for where to attempt that rendezvous. To go a little bit further, transits are almost certainly going to be detected using optical and infrared detectors primarily. That's because that's the wavelength of light in which stars naturally shine. The conversation after that point might evolve to a specific radio frequency and to perhaps more regular intervals. But that initial hello, that first communication, is greatly aided by having this mutually agreeable time of transit. Think of it as the universe's conversation icebreaker. Of course, a thousand worlds is actually quite a small sample by astronomy standards. And so this will only really work if intelligence is very common. And so perhaps it's a long shot to think that these reciprocal transits are genuinely a medium for interstellar communication. But ultimately, that's the nature of looking for intelligent life out there. It's always a long shot. But the potential reward of a success from this high-risk endeavor, it's beyond compare. That's why here at the Cool Worlds Lab, we have been trying to look for strange signatures in our data sets. And if we manage to get some funding, I think we could start doing this in the transit light curves themselves as well. And who knows, maybe, just maybe in one of these transits, there is somebody out there saying hello, waiting for us to pick up the other end of this tin can telephone and answer the call.